Today we have Arjun uh, Narayan, who is the CEO and co-founder of Materialize. And as I hyped up on the mailing list, Materialize is probably fair to say that the hottest database startup right now. Is that that's, that's a fair statement? Um, I'll so take it. Prior to that, uh, he was a software engineer at CockroachDB. And then prior to that, uh, in his past life, he was a PhD student at Penn working on differential privacy, which is somewhat related to or is related to what Materialize is all about. So I met Arjun, I guess, 2016 when I visited CockroachDB. And then they came and visited Carnegie Mellon 2017. And I distinctly remember at dinner, you, you said to me point blank, oh, I think the timely data flow from Frank Macheri is very cool. I want to put that in CockroachDB. You remember saying that? I do remember saying that. In fact, I, I said that to basically everybody at Cockroach. And um, they said, no. <laughs> right? Well, it's not that they said no. It just wasn't you know, aligned with the product they were building. It's sort of its own thing. Right. So he dropped the mic and then went off and, and, and built Materialize. So with that, Arjun, go for it. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this quarantine talk. I hope everyone's doing OK. Um, and before I dive in, I want to call out that you, know, you can try Materialize right now. You can download it right now uh, by, you know, from Homebrew or just going to the GitHub. Um, and you, know, you might want to download it before we run out of stock. The other day, I went to the Oracle store, and they were rationing OLTP to just two TPMC for a warehouse. It's pretty bad out there. Uh, Anyway, to the Oracle lawyers listening, that was a joke. I swear on David, David DeWitt's honor that I didn't run any benchmarks on your database. All right, to business. Um, for our agenda today, I'm going to first talk about like streaming databases, what they are. Then I'll cover a little bit of background on the streaming ecosystem and timely data flow, the data flow engine that's at the heart of Materialize. And then finally, I'll talk about Materialize, and then I'll give you a demo of it actually in action. Um, I want to add that I'm open to questions, heckling, interruptions, everything. I have a whiteboard set up uh, in front of me. I can freeform draw, uh, just as if we are in a classroom lecture. So, like, just just go for it. Um, all right. So, what's a streaming database? Um, what, what I mean by that is that instead of being optimized for processing ad hoc transactional or analytical queries, it is optimized for view maintenance on an ongoing basis over streams of already processed transactions. Uh, and so, like, let, let, let's, let's, let's sort of rewind the clock about 30, 40 years and talk about, you know, what, what data processing was like and sort of build up some intuition for why this is a thing you might even care about or want. So traditionally, the world was divided into two broad categories. So OLTP, online transactional stores, and OLAP, or online analytical stores. And of course, uh, you might have some different flavors of these. You might have like a time series OLAP database. You might have like a graph OLAP database or a graph OLTP databases. But broadly speaking, most systems pretty much fall into one of these two categories. And they're, they're sort of architected very differently, right? So the systems on the left, your OLTP systems, they're designed for high concurrency, lots of transactions happening simultaneously, you know, lots of writes, lots of reads, some of these grouped up into transactions that have to be atomically committed or rolled back. Um, meanwhile, on the right, you don't have, you don't have writes, you don't have concurrency, but you have lots of other different things. So you have things like, you know, very complex, large transactions, multi-way joins, subqueries, aggregating over large dumps of historical data. Um, and it, it, this is sort of like a different set of constraints, a different set of things to optimize for. So you, one could imagine that one ends up in sort of a widely different part of the design space when you're looking at OLTP versus OLAP, right? And, and, and I'm sure like folks in this, in this uh, database uh, seminar, like, get that and are not quite familiar with it. Um, so just sort of running, running through some, sort of give some intuition, uh, mostly because this is the intuition we use for benchmarking these systems. Like imagine you're running an online store, right? So like you're taking orders, you're, you're keeping track of inventory, you're shipping these orders out. Uh, this is the TPC benchmark view of the world. Uh, the old TP systems are used to keep track of live inventory, right? Like the major concerns are that you don't sell something that you've run out of stock uh, you ensure that when you ship an order, it's reflected transactionally in the shipments table so that 
you know, if you have multiple people concurrently shipping out outstanding orders, no two workers ship the same order. You know, that's sort of, that's sort of constraint. Um, and um, on the other hand, the OLAP systems allow business analysts to answer questions about the, the company as a whole. So, you know, someone at HQ, some sort of analyst is, you know, trying to figure out our sales up this quarter, you know, you want to like seasonally adjust the inventory stock levels and look at it year on year, you know, ask questions like what is North America sales versus Europe sales, that sort of thing. And that sort of qu query requires grinding through all of your data, potentially like joining a bunch of tables, things like that. And the two systems sort of end up in radically different physical layouts, execution engines, because they're fundamentally optimizing for very different tasks, right? So, so the systems on the right pretty much operate on static data that's infrequently updated. They don't really do locks or don't really have to worry about isolation. A little bit, but not, not the way that all TV systems have to. Uh, they, they're optimized for really, really fast reads over lots of data. And on the other hand, the OLTP systems pretty much can't handle any large transactions. They're pretty much designed for getting people in, getting them served, and getting them out, and never losing data and never lying to anyone, right? And and in the in the old world, the stuff in the middle, the the, the ETL, it, it's it's just like there to get stuff from the left to the right, right? So ETL stands for extract, transform, load, and that's exactly what's going on. If you have two different formats because they're optimized for different ways of storing things, let's just say root. You know, to paint a broad brush, row oriented for OLTP and column oriented for OLAP, you're taking stuff from the format on the left and transforming it and loading it into the format on the right. Now, the main problem with this, why, like, why, why would we even want to do something different from this sort of workhorse architecture, is that OLAP systems fundamentally are working on outdated views of the world. They're looking at day old stuff, and sometimes it's, it's for some some companies it's several days old, and and even at best it's often like hours old. And there's lots of useful things you might want to do that requires more recent data than a day old data set. And so, you know, the challenge for most people is is when they're trying to architect some application or or some use case if they're or traditional architect, they can connect directly to the OLTP system, you know, perhaps connect to a read replica or something, they can do up-to-date reads, or um, they have to make do with stale data. And if they do the up-to-date reads, um, they pretty much have access to it in the form that is optimized for those OLTP transactions, and uh, otherwise they just have to work with old data. Now, look, this isn't a new problem, right? So people recognize this even in the 90s, and you definitely had some technologies for shipping data around from OLTP systems. You had these enterprise service buses, you had enterprise application integration platforms. Um, and roughly those systems evolved to what, what I would call sort of this idealized version of the architecture today. Uh, you have broadly speaking two pipelines. You have a streaming pipeline for getting data out in real time. And then you have a batch pipeline that's very similar to what we had before, right? It's it, the, the streaming pipeline sends data live, whereas the batch pipeline still takes the hours. And now, th this is the idealized picture, and like, let's look at like what it is today, right? So like, the reality is, like, while the batch pipeline has gotten a lot better, uh, the streaming pipeline is very, very nascent. You're, you're pretty much on your own in terms of building things. The official term for this is microservices, but I think the more technically accurate term is the Wild West. A lot of, a lot of you know, write your own join algorithm and application code, uh, why don't you do that? Uh, you know, use a NoSQL store on the side for state management, scale it, scale it up and scale it down yourselves. And, and these are all sort of papering over the real problem, which is that there really aren't tools that help you out here. Who's this, this dude? Excellent, sorry? Who's this dude? Who's the, There's that? this YouTube video. It's, it's a screenshot from a YouTube video. Um, I okay. recommend you watch it. It's, it's you know, it, I think it's supposed to be a parody video, but I think the more apt term for it is a documentary. Um, it exactly captures sort of the hellish world you get into where you have you have to sort of talk to about 14 different systems, even get the state that you need to compute the view that you're trying to compute. Um, and so our goal really is to make all of this a lot saner, right? So like there's so many of these microservices that morally speaking for a database audience would recognize they're just computing and keeping up to date materialized views. Sorry, my, my slides keep... Uh, Flip and apologize for that. Is this PowerPoint? 
This is Keynote. It's just my iPad's really sensitive, so it just. Oh, okay. It just, it's like, it's not the older thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just have to like not touch it. Now, now, kind of morally speaking, like I was saying, these things are a lot of mark. Not every microservice, right? There's microservices that are doing transactional things, but many microservices are morally speaking just computing materialized views over changing streams of data. And the problem is existing databases aren't really architected for efficiently maintaining materialized views over rapidly changing data. And that's exactly what materialize is all about. It's a database that's just purely optimized for view maintenance. And I think this is something new with like appropriate caveats for, you know, when you're giving a database top, everything was already invented in the eighties by somebody, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but you know, commercially speaking, like, this is fairly novel. Um, again, like the term materialized view isn't a new one, right? Like many OLTP systems and many OLAP systems often have support for materialized views. However, systems like materialized that are designed for view maintenance can often handle, and this is our sort of kind of contention that can handle higher loads for, for workloads that reissue the same queries over and over again against fast changing data. And, and what, you know, I'll, I'll get more specific about this sort of later on in the talk, but ideally we want to do work proportional to, you know, the, the, you know, the, the amount of, of data that we have to keep, that we have to keep around in the final result rather than in proportion to the number of times that the result needs to be inspected, right? So uh, just because thousand people issue the same query or the same, the same service, say a dashboard issues the same query a thousand times. We don't have to pretend to be surprised 999 times that we've seen this join. Right? Like we can maybe go ahead and incrementally maintain some amount of work. All right. Now, before we start to talk about what Materialize does, I'm going to give you some background on the streaming ecosystem and sort of where Materialize fits in. And, you know, some disclaimers are necessary here because these are my opinions and they're a little bit subjective, but hopefully they help give you some intuition for you know, what I'm talking about. So like what's fundamentally different about online view maintenance? Right? Um, first, queries are long running. So in contrast to say all app systems where queries are you know, optimized by a query optimizer at execution time, Streaming queries need to be optimal for approximately forever, right? So OLTP query systems or OLAP systems can make a best effort guess to a query plan and then sort of collect statistics, run type statistics and on subsequent runs of the same query plan, they, they can switch up the plan. Uh, and, and, and so if, you, if you're issuing 1,000 queries uh, and you can replan 1,000 times, um, um, but in a, in, in, in a OLVM system, you know, once you create the view, it's, it's, it's pretty much, pretty much replanning involves shutting down that view and starting over from scratch, right? So this means that, you know, query planning um, is a lot more, you know, there's a lot, it's a, it's a lot higher stakes game. Um, and, and second, query planning is itself a lot harder because existing query planners in say, old TP systems will maintain like an evaluation context and, and will oftentimes bail and just like use that context to like rerun a query sort of de novo, uh, say a sub query, right? Like you just don't have that option in a data flow engine that needs to statically have a query plan fully planned out physically from the very get go. It also means say something like error handling is a lot more difficult, right? Like the show must always go on. Like you, you, you just have to find some way to keep making forward progress. This also means that there are no table statistics, right? Most of the query optimization literature in OLAP systems is totally oriented around the idea of getting really, really good cardinality estimates of your tables um, and using that to choose, you know, the perfect query plan. But street in streaming is a little bit like entering the matrix, right? So you can't think about picking the perfect join ordering based on all your perfect cardinality estimates. You first have to realize that there is no perfect join ordering. You have to do all the join at once and be very, joins at once and be very robust to individual streams changing, you know, wildly swinging the number of events. So maybe joining a slow moving stream against a fast moving stream. And all of a sudden the, fa the slow moving stream is also a fast moving stream. Right? So, In traditional, uh, sorry. Like with streaming workloads, like isn't oftentimes like say, 
you know, I realize it, you know, I don't want to take a, like a data warehouse view of it, but like there's the fact table and then there's the dimension tables. The dimension tables would be static in the streaming world. And then you're getting new entries to the fact table. So in that case, you do know something about the dimension tables. So you, you, you could have some statistics or are you saying that in, in materialize, like there are no fixed static tables? Right. So, so one challenge here is like, if, if, like in, in, in a traditional, in a traditional, OLAP context, you'll absolutely have that. In streaming, oftentimes people will do things like they will reissue the, the dimension tables because those have been updated, right? And so, so you, you'll suddenly see a whole lot of changes um, on your dimension tables because they just got sort of batch ETL updated. And this can be catastrophic for some like query plans that end up being you know, quadratic if, if the thing that you assumed was not changing at all like suddenly changes on you. Now an OLAP warehouse wouldn't care because it would just like throw everything away and replan everything, right? It doesn't really run into this problem. But in, in, in the streaming world, things that don't change can occasionally change in ways that would be catastrophic to your query plan. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah, but I, I'd have to sort of see, like, I, I can see people doing stupid things, but is that the common, is that common enough? Um, like, like, like drop the whole dimension table and then load it back in rather than doing like an incremental update. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately it is, it is common. Uh, that, okay. that, that's, that's how you, you know, it, it, sometimes, sometimes it's not even your fault, right? It's like an upstream system's fault that's doing like a daily batch you know, uh, dump. Got it, yeah, what do you yeah. do if like someone's issuing a backup and, and reissuing? Yep. Okay. Um, and uh, again, like this isn't like a lost cause, right? Like, like it's just a set of constraints you have to optimize for. And and I'm honestly, like you know, some things are easier here. For instance, the writes are all ordered for us by the stream processor, right? Uh, just like in OLAP systems, there's no real concurrency control that we have to do. Events are pretty much pre-ordered. Our task is more sort of keep up with the events as they happen at really high data volumes rather than you know do tricky admission control locking you know, maintain serializable histories things like that and then finally um we're totally going to restrict ourselves to query patterns that are relatively well known i say relatively well known and mostly repeated because we do want to be able to uh issue do ad hoc queries what i do want to say is you know uh, an olap warehouse will probably beat us on sort of truly ad hoc random query workloads on fixed you know batch data uh, but you still want to leave some room for, you know, doing ad hoc queries within similar patterns. They think like queries that reuse the same indexes, things like that. All right. What do we want from streaming? Now, now this, this is where, you know, no holds barred. These are my, my, my opinions, right? Uh, some, some of these folks may not agree with. Like first, like people want SQL, right? So streaming, writing streaming applications should be as easy as, you know, writing a CRUD app. Right? You just write declarative queries about what you want, and it should just appear. Um, writing imperative code should be a last resort. And when I say SQL, I really mean like actual SQL, like the horrendous stuff, like the, the stuff that's really buried under the dark corners, the eight-way joins, the group buys with having clauses, the subqueries, the correlated, uncorrelated, all that jazz. Um, and like, hopefully, like I'm speaking to, you know, fellow cult members in this talk, but like, I sort of bring this up because a lot of existing streaming engines don't really support SQL. Um, without, without full support for, you know, arbitrary joins, arbitrary non-window join conditions, like it's not really SQL. And second, so this is sort of a manifesto. It's like if there's no change in the data, don't do anything. This seems like something somewhat obvious to see, but existing stream processors are, have these massive hardware footprints, even when they're selling relatively low amounts of data now, just because the queries are, are very complex. To rephrase this, this sort of a little bit, it, it should behave a little bit like, you know, Postgres on your system, on your laptop, right? Like I'm running Postgres on my laptop right now. I'm not issuing any queries against it. It just sits there quietly in the background. Uh, stream process should also sort of behave this way. And then third, sort of joins are absolutely crucial. Windowing your joins should not be mandatory. Um, and a little bit about this. Existing streaming frameworks today mostly require that the streaming joins be windowed along a temporal dimension. And what this means concretely is if you have an input stream that's changing over time, the join condition is only evaluated over some fixed window of data. So I'm sort of gonna draw this out a little bit. So if you have two input streams, right? And I've, I've got time coming down, and this is input A and this is input B, right? And like sort of you keep getting new events 
over time. And if we're joining these two to, together, uh, the join is only evaluated sort of on some window. And then, and then this window moves over here, and then a window moves over here. And, and this is just like all wrong, right? Like a join means, you know, any, any event here can match with anything to the, to the entire history of the other stream. Um, and do, do, you, do you support like the streaming SQL window stuff, like the tumbling windows or the, or the sliding windows semantics or? Like we, we intend to, we okay. don't consider that hard. We consider like the hard part is supporting joins that aren't windowed, right? The joins okay. that are over the entirely, entire, like frankly, like the, the like windows can be mm, mostly or, or, you know, just express your join as a join condition over your over your streams like and and if if it's possible for us to only sort of keep materialized some small subset of it like leave that to us right like we, we'll take care of that you just like declaratively say what you want Does I, that I, make sense? I, yeah no, absolutely I, I always wondered like how many like reasoning about the window types and shit like that like i don't think most people can do that so I think like yeah, not, I, not I, having to declare is awesome. And fundamentally, like I, the existing systems force you to do that because they're not capable of dealing with unwindowed joints. Like it's it's a little bit of a sleight of hand where they say, hey, hey, you can window your joints. Like it, it, I didn't ask if I if I can. Like I want to not do that. Does that make sense? You, like do you want to you want to um, name names? No, okay. like that. I'm actually this is Chrysanthes, uh, professor at the University of Pittsburgh. I will uh, raise some exceptions to your uh, uh, statement. Actually, the streaming window uh, or the window operators are uh, because they support a specific functionality. What you are advocating, basically, you are going back to streaming uh, processing of traditional databases, where now you are creating your windows or your snapshots in order to achieve this notion of uh, streaming windows. So there are two different functionalities. It's not that one uh, uh, got it wrong and the other got it right. At least uh, the way that I understand your statements is you're trying to bridge and transfer technology known from the traditional databases into the streaming. And of course, as you know from the query processing, you have the streaming mode of evaluating queries. So this is exactly what uh, at least I understand you are uh, advocating. Am I wrong? I, I think that's fair. Thank you. Yeah. Andy, any, any, any follow-ups to that? No, it's keep okay. going. All right. Um, all right. So, all right. So let's get to materialize, right? So it's like, now we've got a little bit of the religion out of the way. Um, Let's talk about like how we deliver on these sort of you know, desiderata, right? So materialize is built on top of two projects, timely data flow and differential data flow. The way to think about this sort of layered architecture is timely data flow is a streaming compute engine at the heart of materialize. It's a scale out stateful cyclic data flow engine. It allows fo folks to write arbitrary Rust code as operators and these operators run as part of data flows in a scale out cooperatively scheduled fashion over a large cluster. More on this later, but just remember that these, you know, timely data flow has no opinions as to like what operators you write. You can write arbitrary programs that maintain arbitrary state and sort of pass messages along. The only interesting things about this operator that timely data flow asks is that along with input data, these operators are fed timestamps, right? And these operators, you know, they need to occasionally relinquish the capability to emit output at some times for the system as a whole to make problems. So you can think of an operator as getting taught like inputs at T1, T2, T3, and at some point the operator makes a statement, you know what, here's some output, I'm done with T2. Uh, anything I, any output I send will occur at times T3 or greater, right? Um, on top of that is differential data flow. Now, timely is an opinionated about the operator, but boy, differential is a very opinionated set of operators, right? Uh, just because timely lets you write arbitrary operators doesn't mean you should. Differential operators should be familiar to the audience here, right? Like this operator's name join and aggregate, filter and map and things like that. Like, so, like, care has been taken to build minimal tasteful operators. And one additional operator that will not be familiar to the audience here is called a range. 
Um, you can think of it sort of as like an index building operator that takes care of efficient state management for any other operator that wants to outsource state management to the range operator. It's kind of a workhorse operator in differential data flow because a lot of other operators, for instance, join, like it has to, it has to um, uh, build large stateful indexes in order to deal with large historical windows of data that it must you know, evaluate join conditions over. Um, and then finally at the top, we have materialize. So materialize is probably the thing that looks the most familiar to this audience, right? It, it does things like handling client connections, maintaining a catalog of tables and views, and I shouldn't say tables of streams and views and, and things like that. It, it does parsing, planning, optimizing of input queries and constructing these data flow plans from these uh, input queries. It definitely has to do some things very differently than the more familiar sort of traditional databases. Um, you know, constructing data flow plans is a little bit different from constructing like volcano plans, but you know, it, it, it's sort of, it, it's close enough, right? Um, do, 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 does your stream require you to have like punctuations or like the, 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 the guaranteed delivery of timestamps at, at different, like this, at fixed intervals? Like, I, like what, is this, what is the stream semantics like thinking about like the, the early streaming stuff from like the early 2000s? I'm not sure I'm familiar with that. Um, okay. You you might have to ask more. You might have to say more, or uh, if okay. we can also punt to Frank, who who has a sort of encyclopedic understanding of the literature. Or, I mean, Panos, like the, the the punctuation stuff was like, like I'm guaranteeing that every every so often there's like, a, like, a, like a, an event shows up. There may be no data in it, but it says like you know, th this is the boundary of a window. So you mean you mean like you get an event at a time t, and you have a punctuation that says like. Um, you know, you have seen every. We are now at time t. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You told totally, you totally need need your inputs to tell you when they will not issue you. You know, when they are done issuing you inputs as of a timestamp, and if they don't give you that, then you can't sort of you can you can you can sort of make some assumptions, but then you may have to sort of you know, go back on your word, which means you don't have correct answers. Like punctuation is necessary for sort of correct answers or you know okay. iso isolation guarantees. Okay. In practice, there's a lot of systems that just don't have punctuation, right? Like if you if you if you if you're doing change data capture from an old TP system that has, you know, transaction IDs and you're passing those through as punctuations, then everything's going to be fine and dandy. But oftentimes, as we've discovered, um, existing middleware often throws that stuff out, and then we we have to make assumptions. Does that make sense? Yeah, keep going. Good. All right. So so. To understand timely data flow, let's like talk about sort of traditional streaming systems, right? Like uh, the, the way they mostly work is they take their data flow, they have data flow operators too, and, and they partition the sort of one data flow operator per worker. These, my worker typically, I mean like a, like a compute core, like a, a physical CPU. And you know, they, they pass messages on to each other. And this, this actually can get very expensive for complex queries, even on relatively low data volume, right? So, this 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 um, way of sending data around could, can often mean that you know relatively small amounts of data are just like passing no ops through the whole system until it comes out the other side. And if you have a very complex data flow graph, uh, that that's a lot of busy work for little little change. In, in contrast, timely data flow, um, no, timely data flow. Hold on, yeah, is is uh, timely data flow. Cooperative, cooperatively schedules every operator on every worker and then shards the entire data flow graph by key. So, so you know, this thing scales down. Like the, the interesting part here isn't that it scales up. It totally scales up at very large query volumes. But what it also does is it scales down, right? You can, you can, you can have a single, single core version of timely data flow that uh, as, as, as if some of you are familiar with uh, Frank's uh, cost paper literature, um, outperforms other big data systems at sort of a given an arbitrarily large number of compute nodes to compete to compete. Um, now, now the other the other thing, other, other sort of principle in timely data flow is that the timestamps drive the movement of data, and and you know, all, all all data items sort of are sent through operators with an attached timestamp, and the operator, as I, I said before can emit sort of data at that timestamp or can also, after it's done, say, you know, I'm done with this timestamp and, and, and sort of uh, 
relinquishes the right to ever emit emit outputs. And there's there's yeah. no corrections, right? I can't come by like a minute later and say, hey, remember timestamp T1, here's an here's a here's the actually the correct value for it. Um no, it can't do that. It but, but what what so, so, so materialize would, would would reject that. Materialize would reject that. You you mean as like an input to the system? Yeah, like like on my stream, like uh, it's, it's, I guess you're basically saying the stream cannot send updates. So the screen, the screen, the stream can totally send updates. Like, like there's a difference between the of the value of 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 v of of of, of key, you know, of key k has changed from v1 to v2 at time t3. Like, like you can totally pass that through the system. It's just like, don't tell us like the time at which that happened, and don't sort of retroactively go back and rewrite history. Does that make sense? Like, like updates are totally possible in the system. But updates happen but as are, time advances. But, are, which, but it, it's timestamp t. It's, it's timestamp t ten. But now I get an update record that says at timestamp t four. I told you the value was six, but now the value is seven. Why would you want? Why would you ever want to do that? Sometimes you don't know the, the value of the trade until after the trade occurs or something. I've, I've seen that example in in, the, in fine, fine tech. Well then, well then you 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 can you know um, up. So so we have we have. Uh, what you may want is a multi-temporal timestamp where a timestamp can have both an event time and a system time dimension, right? So okay. that, that allows arbitrary historical, like we could totally support that, right? So, okay. um, it, sorry, let me, let me be specific. We can support that at timely and differential data flow. Support for that in materialize has not yet been added. Excellent, okay, cool. Um, um, yeah, so, so differential data flow on top of sort of this, this uh, build these um, data flow operators that are fairly opinionated and you know, these execute. And on top of that, materialize builds the SQL, the SQL parsing planning and execution that we all know and love. The, the catalog a co coordinator to coordinate all of these data flows being installed and uninstalled, et cetera. Um, so, you know, let, let's talk about sort of things we really um, care about. So, so writing performant data flow programs is very hard. And, and the, the, this experience has taught us that that's all the more reason we can't expect application developers to actually do this in their day-to-day. -day. They, they have even less time to ship than we do, um, and uh, they have, you know, other constraints. Second, sort of, the workhorse of differential data flow is the arrange operator that does efficient incremental index maintenance. Now, most other stateful data flow systems, they, they outsource the state management to sort of a sidecar and sense of RocksDB per operator, right? Like, like I love RocksDB, um, but RocksDB is a poor choice as operator state manager for streaming systems because it's optimized for objectives that are sort of orthogonal to stream processing. Like, like it, it's, it's, it's very good at uh, durability, at, at high read concurrency, and all these things are totally orthogonal to needs of a stream processor. Um, sort of phrased in another way, like RocksDB, you know, it, it has additional compaction threads, right, um, to, to, to efficiently maintain its log-structured merge tree. But efficiently compacting state is primarily the computation task required of all data flow systems. The choice of when to schedule compaction is the task, is probably the most important task that must be considered alongside all of the other sort of computation tasks. Uh, and, and has to be sort of fused in sort of in, in, in with the other operators that you are scheduling in your cooperatively scheduled data flow system. Is it, so is, is the, uh, I mean, is, is RockDB a bad choice because it's an LSM, or is it? Is it because it it's a full fledged you know storage manager that's meant for other purposes than what you're trying, trying to do in materialize? The latter. So the arrange operator also maintains okay. a, an LSM sort of under the hood. Okay. Uh, the problem is that you know state man like most other streaming systems have punted on state management or sort of dealing with when to do this, when to do compaction and things like that by outsourcing it to a full fledged storage manager that was built from the ground up to be the storage manager for an OLTP system. Got it, okay, okay. When really, like, this is, this is the hardest part of, of building a stream processor. And, okay. and you sort of have to be very intentional about what you compact when. Okay, cool. 
And then sort of finally, sort of another thing we've sort of come to believe in is that SQL really requires 100% coverage. Like there's a lot of, you know, SQL, SQL inspired by SQL or, you know, almost SQL or SQL except the joins sort of thing. And like that really doesn't work for the users because um, the abstraction layers require you to be able to forget about at least, at least to some extent what's going on under the hood, right? If you have to think, if you have to mentally think you know, what is the underlying implementation going to do? Like you'd never, you'd never be able to sort of make progress unless you like fully understood the, the underlying system. And at, which, at, which, at that point, the abstraction layer just sort of gets in your way, right? Like when I write a C code program, I don't think about the number of, you know, x86 instructions that happen on their hood unless like I'm, I'm, I'm all the way off the deep end and writing really, really, really high performance code. Most programmers are able to live at the abstraction layer. And we put a lot of effort into getting to very, very close SQL fidelity. And of course, there's a, there's a few instances where, you know, it, it's, it's apples to oranges, like the streaming setting is not the old database setting, uh, where you do have to make some changes and you can't have full functionality, but like those have to be the very, 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 very minor exceptions. Can you give an example? Uh, window functions. Window functions yeah. Yeah. have, yeah. because inserting a change could change an entire window of like change the position of, of so many different rows that you, you end up, it's better for the user to not think that way in, in when, when dealing with streaming systems and when they can re replace window functions with some other form of writing their query, they're better off doing that rather than us trying to figure out how to optimize away these massive amount of internal changes that have to be shuffled, shuttled through the system. I mean, hundred percent coverage. I mean, that's, let's be honest here. Like the, the SQL standard is what six books. Like right? nobody has hundred percent coverage. Yeah. yeah. So, so like, um, what's, oh, the, what's the bare minimum you, you support? Like joins, subqueries, uh, CTEs. CTE. C, we don't support CTEs yet, but like we absolutely plan to, and we should. Like you really, the, the, these things are sort of necessary to port. Um, you know most of the education and expertise that people have built up in terms of dealing with uh, SQL. Okay. All right, cool. All right, let's uh, jump to a demo. I had a demo open somewhere. Um, it's my Zoom, oh, there we go, all right. Um, all right, so let's take a look at, um, at uh, what Materialize looks like. So for, first off, like Materialize today pretends to be Postgres, right? So this is sort of an opinionated choice because we, we love Postgres and also a lot of tooling, existing tooling runs on top of Postgres. So, so the first thing you'll see is that, uh, you know, you just connect and materialize using PSQL. Second, um, you know, to, let me pause this video a little bit and give you a little bit of context. Uh, I, I'm gonna set up a demo where I'm running a MySQL instance in upstream that is running the TPCC benchmark. Now, the, like I hinted to a little bit earlier, the TPCC benchmark is, you know, there's an online store and orders are happening all the, all the time um, on some upstream warehouses, orders are being taken, orders are being shipped, uh, sort of all of these things are happening transactionally. And then all of the transactions that actually commit are being flowed through Kafka into Materialize. So Kafka as a stream processor is just sending us um, all of this and it's sort of one stream per table that's being modified. Um, um, and, and over here you see the, the, these are the tables. There's a customer table, a district table, the item table, uh, and so on. Um, and we are going to materialize some queries um, over these tables, right? Um, for, for folks who are familiar with OLAP benchmarking, we're gonna be materializing TPCH queries. So if you take a look at the customer table, there's you know, customer information, payments, things like that. Um, and we've installed a few views. now. We are not yet at 100% coverage, but we are working very hard to it. These are of the 22 TPCH uh, queries. Uh, we've installed some, of, some subset of them as views that are being incrementally maintained under the system. Now, when we say incrementally maintained, like they are being actually materialized as the underlying data is changing with every update. They're completely queryable. Um, and they are live connected to this to, to Kafka. So if you just do a select star from query one, you're getting you know exactly the query as TPCH query one, absolutely up to date as of this second. So uh, your show view show tables is throwing me for a loop because that's my SQL syntax. 
We actually support, so we support both the Postgres syntax and the MySQL syntax for these things where it's just like quality okay. of life. People just yep, like yep, type yep. the thing yep. and they're like, why, why, why did you want me to do a backslash, you know, whatever. It's like, yes. yep. it's just, just like add support for both in the parser. Yep. Um, so, so it's Postgres plus plus, right? It's like things that, again, this is a little bit uh, just quality of life improvements. All right, so create view test one, you can create additional views uh, downstream of these views. You can chain all these views together. And this, this one's really interesting, right? So uh, take, a, take a look at this, right? So it's create view test one as select sum. So, so maybe you're selecting the sum of the count order all the time. Um, and, and you just want to sort of remember that, that's in, you know, you can create a view for that. Now, if, if you create a materialized view of this, you're going to get a lot lower latency, right? So the query patterns that you expect to run over and over again, install materialized views for them, and the, the speed at which you can query from them will be much, much faster. All right, we're just going to drop those views um, that, I, that I spun up. Um, All right, and uh, this is query two. Uh, we're just going to select from that that as well. Uh, again, you can do all the things that you typically might do interactively as sort of additional predicates when selecting from these views, uh, or you can install all of you can install that limit all the way up as as its own view, um, so that it is pre-computed for you. This is TPCH query five. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the TPCH queries, uh, almost all of them are sort of picked from query patterns that are a little bit adversarially picked. So you know, there's 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 six way joins, there's eight way joins, there's correlated subqueries that you really can't efficiently execute unless you perform the correlation in your planning and optimization stages, uh, things like that. This is um, a video, right? So you, you can't run explain, right? Yeah, this is a video because I don't trust uh, my laptop. As CEO, I never run any code, so my laptop's a total junk. So I had Frank run this for me and send me the video. But like, so if we download it, like, would explain work and actually show the plan? I mean, it'll show you the data flow plan, the data flow, explain works, and it will show you the data flow that we run. Um, and, and you can sort of inspect that to, that okay. there's multiple different flavors of explain just as in Postgres. Um, it's not apples to apples to Postgres because it's not, it's not doing the same thing under the hood, sure. right? So yeah, yeah. Um, as Frank has shared in the chat, uh, you can look at the SQL docs for explain to, search, to see precisely what we will show you. Um, another thing I want to call out here, uh, I'm going to pause here for, uh, for a bit. Um, when you select this, you can also select the internal timestamp at which this query was ex executed. Like, like I mentioned before, we're flowing timestamps through the system um, alongside you know, every piece of data. Um, and when you select a query, you are getting that query executed at a single timestamp across that query. Right? Like, this is important because you know, you're getting essentially snapshot isolation guarantees as you, you know, as the underlying views are being updated, right? Like every row is coming at exactly the same timestamp. And we added this other thing, which isn't the SQL standard, which we think is really cool called tail. And what tail does is, you know, it, it'll, you can, you can, you can, you can run tail, you can run select star and give you the result and you press up enter, up enter, but you can also ask the system to, Hey, like flow me the diffs as and when they happen. Right? So, so what this is telling you is, um, at timestamp blah 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 four seven four the second last line you know re retract retract the row where I said supplier four fifty two had you know this number and then also add in instead one nine five six two two three um, as their revenue right so this is a revenue slight revenue bump of what looks like a little under five hundred dollars for supplier 452 and this is being sort of eagerly pushed to you and you can also do tail with snapshots you get the select and then you can sort of get subscribed to changes that are happening this is not quite you know SQL standard but it's still you know we think very cool you can also just do the up enter thing that uh, folks may do um, all right do you support subscribe notify 
Um, that's on the roadmap. We don't support the, that right now. Uh, it's sort of an obvious one to add in support for. Do people, um, do people ask for it? Yes. Imagine, yes? Yes. Like, there's enough people actually using that functionality in Postgres today? Yes. Interesting. OK, awesome. People, people love that. Um, the other thing I want to call out here is, um, sorry, I just want to sort of rewind a little bit um, over here. You, you ha we have these internal logging views that we keep running alongside the views of uh, the, the sort of data views, right? And, and th these allow you to introspect sort of like how many records are in the view. And, and you know, some views are very large, like uh, query five has a lot of intermediate state, but take a look at query six, it's just maintaining 229 records, right? So uh, the memory footprint of maintaining these incrementally updatable views can be quite small, right? It, it's not, it, it, all of this is running on a single node, like it, it, it's totally feasible to run this over large sets of data. And we have some additional sort of, uh, there's an additional blog post that you might want to check out that talks about how this can often be surprisingly very, very small. Um, incrementally updating can be proportional to the size of your output, which you know may just end up being a very, very small number of things. If you're keeping it, say you're keeping a, you know, a leaderboard uh, you know, of, of the top 10, like we don't have to keep very, very much more. We have to keep some, some amounts more, but not too much more. It, it's certainly not proportional to the input size. So the, the I mean, there's a buffer pool, right? So, so you're able to swap pages in and out, right? Or is everything, is, everything Sorry, in is, 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 is there actually a buffer pool where you can write things up to disk or does everything have to fit in memory? Um, it uses just system OS swap uh, as, as, as uh, buffering up to disk. So it comfortably buffers up to disk and maintains fairly, fairly clean performance, even though even when you get your resident uh, sort of set size to, you know, hundreds of gigabytes. You're, you're using MMAP. Yeah, uh, pretty much, yeah. I, I believe I believe we're we're literally just like, allocating memory and setting and 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 not even using a map. We're just using. Uh, do you have a the, single uh, virtual how many, memory? How many writer threads do you support? Sorry. Like, is it a single writer thread? So one one thing that's different here is that each core of the data flow system and timely data flow maintains its own independent sharded state. So each, so if, you have, if you're running this on 16 threads, you have 16 separate threads of execution that are all maintaining their own state. Yeah. And none of them are, like, they're message passing state yep. between each other. Yep. That's, that's why you can do MMAP. Yeah. Again, we're not doing MMAP. We're just using virtual memory. I mean, it's anonymous MMAP. I know. It's, it's basically, yeah. It's, yes. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> Yeah, no, then that, that's pretty much the end of my demo and the end of my talk. So uh, I'm happy to open it up for questions. OK, I have a lot of questions. Uh, but what, anybody else wants to chime in, go for it. And again, I'll leave it open here. Uh, un unmute yourself and then say who you are and where you're coming from. You might want to run some. Oh, there we go. Go, go for it. Uh, my name is Sai. I'm a PhD student in University of Buffalo. Uh, my uh, great talk, by the way. And my Thank you. main question is: so this data flow actually uses uh, multi-way joins, this worst case optimality to kind of do some computations, right? We do not currently use the worst case optimal join. If you're referring to a specific worst case optimal join algorithm, we do not. We are using multi-way joins of a different flavor. Uh, I can sort of, I, I can point you to the content that explains this. There's some um, on the, on Frank McSherry's blog on, on sort of the precise algorithm we use. We do not currently use the worst case optimal join algorithm. If there's the, the specific one, the, Andy, do you know the one I'm talking about? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think you're, the, this NPRR or the uh, logic block stuff, right? Yeah, no, we don't currently use that. That stuff is really cool, and we do hope to sort of use that in the future. So you are using some variant that, that uses the best ideas from multi-way as well as pairwise? Or? Um, I don't want to say best. I, I don't, I, I don't want to say there's anything optimal about what we're doing, right? Um, 
Okay. What we are doing is sort of, we, we, we do process, you know, multi-way joints together in, without having to resort to a tree of binary joint operators. I Beyond see. that, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna make any statements about whether what we do is optimal because it's not the worst case optimal joint algorithm, which is better than what we do. Okay, thank it you. It sounds like it's a quick and dirty something to get up and running. A uh, little bit of that flavor, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Uh, at the same time, it's like, re it, you know, I'm, it, it's able to maintain uh, views over TPCH uh, queries, so it's pretty good. So I, mean, I don't, don't want to talk it down do, too much. Most systems don't do, most systems don't do the multi-way joint stuff. So anything you have, the basic is probably better than what's already out there. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to, to make that statement and no statement further than that. Yes. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Hello, uh, I'm Gostandinos Costa from University of Pittsburgh. I have two questions. The first one is about consistency. What is the idea of the consistency in your system? And the second right. one is about the, I think that the materialized idea is using versioning, right? And you are combining versions in some cases or not? Uh, I, I don't fully understand the second question, but let me answer your first question and then and then throw it back to you. So, uh, consistency-wise, like we, we compute correct answers based on the inputs that you give us, and and so so all all answers are exactly as of a single timestamp. You know, like if if the inputs you are giving us um, have timestamps attached to them, then we can give you exactly answers at specific timestamps that you know that that's essentially snapshot isolation. Um, at all times. I mean, I, I don't believe we can claim anything stronger given that we don't look at, you know, we don't do concurrency in our inputs since they are ordered for us. Um, and, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you about sort of the second question. Okay, thank you for the first answer. Uh, for the second question uh, is about combining different results in different timestamps. Let's say I have a window of uh, five seconds and another window of five seconds. Can I combine them to get the 10 second window answer? Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I follow, if I, if I fully understand the question. So, so you're saying that- Yeah, you're saying you have a window at five seconds and then there's another window at 10 seconds and you want to basically combine them? Yeah. This is the idea. So you, you want to take- so I, I, I think I think he's talking about if you're using like streaming sync st streaming SQL with like the tumbling window semantics or sliding window semantics. No, yeah. we don't support that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Do people ask for that? Like this, the, the like the this, like the streaming SQL from Calcite kind of stuff. Um, no. Okay. That's what I, I think that doesn't surprise me. Uh, hi. Uh Okay. So, yeah, so I have a question. So uh, the interesting thing about like you showed in a demo. Who, who are you? Sorry, who are you? Uh, Where are you coming from? This is Don. I'm from University of Utah and I will be in Pennsylvania in a few months or whatever. So uh, the question is. You, you'll be new faculty at okay. Penn State. Come on, you got to sell yourself. It's, I don't really care that much about that anyway. So uh, the, the reason why I'm asking this, I'm actually checking a, checking a, uh, checking a project, and it's according to our demo, one thing is interesting. You're uh, doing the demo on TPCH and also like on some like pretty much, I would say, OL AP queries that you get some like aggregations out. It's more close to the feeling that I feel more like a data queue-ish stuff. So uh, like my understanding of like material, materialized view are more like, you know, I, I select like a slightly seared like piece of data with some like slight filter with some basic transformations. It's a group of records rather than just a few, you know, aggregations. So I'm wondering if you support that and if you support that, uh, how can I actually do this in a, like a very efficient way? Because a lot of times this can be really messy. Um, so, too, can you say a little bit more about the query pattern that you're asking about? Because I'm not sure I fully um, understand. So, the let's say, let's say, like you ask for like a TPCH query, but you just drop the final part. You drop the aggregation part. You're simply just trying to get, for example, do some grouping and, um, I don't know. Um, are you trying to get the whole table back out? I mean, the group by will, is is essentially the aggregation. Like, what do you like? 
yeah, group buy is one one case. For example, like how do you handle like group buy in this? Like it seems like when you actually show this out, it's actually like one timestamp was two like numbers out, and like another timestamp was another set two numbers out, and another like timestamp was another time uh, like two numbers out. It can be, for example, like I ask for a query that actually pulls out a subset of data or the subset of aggregations of our data. Um, for example, I have a thousand groups, and every time when you update a materialized wheel, you actually have a thousand literals. What are the what are the two numbers? That's what I'm talking about. And like even it can happen in this like weird situation when you actually add a new group by like having more and more like records coming in, which is also possible. So so that's kind of my question is because like you when you materialize something like in every single timestamp, it's not really just a few aggregations. It can be multiple records. Yeah, yeah, and the, more. The, yeah, yeah. That, that totally works, right? Like the reason we picked the TPCH squares for a demo is like we just picked the hardest squares we could find that you know to materialize. But in some sense, what you the query patterns you're saying would actually be easier for us to materialize. Mm -hmm. It's like don't don't do the final grouping. It's like yeah, we have to do all that work anyway. So so you can do something like versioning. For example, I asked for a particular version of this materialized view so that it kind of like piece out different versions and you make a, like a combine all of these small pieces into a whole thing when you report to me. Is that what you're saying? So because that the, the materialized wheel can't grow. The number of rows can grow from ten yes. like rows to twenty rows to thirty rows. It's non yes. like it's not really a like a thing that you, you rebuild it every time you kind of do it incrementally. Yes. Is that correct? Okay, cool. Thanks. Yes. Get out of my way. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, it's my cat. Awesome. No, that's it. Yeah. All right. Any I I have a ton of questions. Uh, I'll just ask the last one. Um what I mean, so you have like the, the time the data flow stuff that, that, that like the core part underneath it. But in terms of everything above above like the core execution engine and maybe also the storage. So like I'm talking like the catalogs, there's the query parser, there's the optimizer, there's the binder. Like what aspect of the, imp the implementation was like surprised you the most of, of that like in terms of being the most difficult yeah. because you're working in like a materialized view environment? Like, and this is this is your second time at the rodeo of doing this because you you did it at Cockroach, like to mimic Postgres, and now you're doing it again. So, so we definitely benefited from like 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 you know one of the reasons we were very confident we could do this is because you know of of our team, there are five of us um, have, were at Cockroach Labs at 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 one point or the other. So you know we we had we we had a very good sense of like the scope of the problem and what we had to do. So uh, you know there wasn't very many surprises there. What was sort of really challenging sort of and, and i hinted at this a little bit earlier was just like query planning is a lot harder in this setting because you really have to do everything possible to get out a static data flow graph and at least at cockroach and and, and also in postgres because we looked at the postgres code as well like oftentimes they use an escape hatch where you know you you, you you, you get as far as you can, but then eventually like you just sort of recursively call back and like push that push a new transaction through with like the remainder of the plan, say it's a subquery or something. And that escape hatch ends up being really useful for like these really gnarly queries. And we just don't have that escape hatch because everything has to be perfectly, completely unrolled to the final form um, before the execution can start. And like once it starts, there's no there's no going back. And that that do ends you, up being do you, are you are you basically saying like like if there's a subquery, if you can decorrelate it, or, or, or you can flatten it, you, like you always have to do that. Like in Postgres, oh, it can yeah. try, but if it can't, it's like, all right, well, I'll do the stupid thing and execute it for every single tuple. Exactly. We, we can never yeah. do that. And yeah, like yeah. That, that's the hardest part. And it turns out everything can be flattened, but you have to go down some fairly dark corners to beat up the query plan. OK, interesting. And so, and so the materialized optimizer is written from scratch? Yes. Is it top down or bottom up? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it might be both simultaneously. Um, we, 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 we have some thoughts about sort of improving the optimizer. So it's not, it's a little bit, it's a little bit ad hoc at the moment. Is it, is it, so is it, it sounds like it's not cost based, it's, it's heuristics. Again, again, like what cost would you use? Like what, what cardinality estimates do you have? But I mean, I, I, so, so like a join, for example, like, would you ever, 
like do you support hash join versus there's this is like a surplus join or is that not the way to think about it i don't believe that's the right way to think about it okay fair enough. Uh, you definitely want to make me make make you know I mean, there is an intermediate state you have to maintain, but is it a hash table or you assume it's sorted? Like there, there are some decisions you can make where a cost-based query, query optimizer could help. Yeah. But it sounds like, like you've gotten this far without it. Yeah. Okay. Which, which and definitely Oracle, things like, sorry, go on. It's, it's what Oracle did for 10 years, 20 years. So you're the new Oracle. <laughs> <laughs> Um, basically, the optimizer today, like Frank points out on chat, optimizes for oh. worst case memory footprint, um, and, and and sort of it's definitely a bigger concern to not have your memory footprint grow very very fast, right? So because you're gonna have to keep that around for forever, um, and, okay. and and we we will trade off computation in order to keep our memory footprint sane. Okay. Sorry, we will trade off doing more computation to keep our memory footprint sane. Okay. Okay. All right, so it's 534. I have a small child. I am the biological father. I have to go help. And this, this terrier here is getting wild. So let's thank Arjun again uh, for joining us and all the, our friends from Materialize. Uh, are there Materialize shirts that are available? There are Materialize shirts that are available. Where do I send them? Uh, well, let, well, I'll send that. We'll do that in a separate email. But this is awesome. Um, so again, everyone, uh, so thanks for coming. Uh, we had a good turnout this time. Wait, wait, wait. There are, we are, there are 50 people on the call, so make sure that you have 50 shirts. OK. But I, I can help see new people, maybe people in Pittsburgh, but, but beyond that. Uh, that okay. We can produce the shirts, but distribution is somebody else's problem. Yeah, yeah I, I can drop by Pittsburgh and pick up one when I drive to Pennsylvania. All right. No, right. no, I so, wanted just to bring this up because it's absolutely great that we have 50 people across the country uh, participating in this. So it's yes. absolutely great. <laughs> it's fantastic. Thank you very so, much. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming to this talk. I really, I really appreciate it.